Anyway, so like I said, um, we're, we're talking about the reasons why, and today we're talking about um, the reasons why we worship. And so basically, I just kind of was thinking, though, before we talk about why we worship, I think it's important for us to know, like, what is worship? Because even, even that can be tricky at times. Um, everybody has a different definition of what they think worship is or how they think about worship. And so um, I'm just going to hit the ground running uh, and jump right into this. Not a lot of intro. And so number one, what is worship? I'm going to surprise you all by saying the shocking thing that number one, worship is not a type of music. Can you believe that? Worship is not a type of music. You see, if worship was only music, then we could decide whether or not we're going to engage in worship based on our own preferences and on our own moods. So if a song didn't, you know, express my preferred style um, or reflect my current mood, then, then I don't have to like it and I don't have to participate in it, right? Like if worship was about a type of music and um, if worship was music, then we could just market it to man, and then man would become a spectator or a consumer of worship instead of an actual participator in worship. So, so in other words, worship, when, it's, when you kind of make it just about music or a type of music, um, basically what you're doing is, is you're making it something for man and not for God. And um, worship is not for us. Worship is for God. Worship is about blessing God. It's not even about blessing us. It's about blessing him. And so um, it's, it's interesting, but in like Greek terminology, when you're looking through the Bible, there, there's not a single word for worship in Greek or Hebrew that has anything to do with music. Nothing. Nothing. They all have to do with, with other things, like with maybe a posture of the heart or with obedience or with sacrifices, but it has nothing to do um, actually with music. And I don't want you to get me wrong or misunderstand me. Music is a powerful tool, and it's an, a, a vehicle that we use to express our worship, um, but music in and of itself isn't worship. Music is an expression of of our worship. And, and I love to express my worship through music. Um, hello, I'm a music minister, so, so I'm all about music. I love to express my worship in that way. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons that I love music is because music is one of the only art forms that engages all three parts of our created beings. So music engages our body, it engages our soul, and it engages our spirit. And so when we worship, we actually use all three parts of ourself, our, our souls, our spirits, and our bodies. And so um, music can help us to engage and love uh, God with every part, our body, our soul, and our spirit. And, and the way that it does this is, uh, is because music um, moves us. Music moves us. It moves our bodies. You, you think about it, it inspires you to move. When the song starts playing, what do you do? You know, you kind of start swaying or you want to dance a little bit. It, it quickens and it slows the rhythms of our hearts. We were even created with musical instruments in our bodies, right? Our hands can clap, our feet can stomp, um, our vocal cords, they work as wind instruments um, and as string instruments, actually, because it's like the... The cords are the string, and it takes our breath, the wind, um, to make the noise. And so, um, obviously, some are better tuned instruments than others, but we won't uh, go there tonight. Um, but see, our bodies were made to be musical, and that's why uh, music affects and it engages our bodies. But music also um, affects and engages our souls. It moves our soul. Like, have you ever heard a song that made you cry? Um, or a song that made your heart happy, or um, you know, uh, of course we've all we've all you know experienced that that a song plays and it maybe brings a memory or it brings an emotion or a feeling. It affects our souls and it affects our emotions and our mind and it inspires pictures and thoughts and feelings and and it can communicate like this full range of emotion with just like a short little phrase or. Um, 
measure or two. You know, like sometimes you can just, all it takes is just to hear the intro of a song, right? And all of a sudden you're already, oh, you're, you're there because it moves you. Um, but music doesn't only just move our bodies, it also moves our souls, but it also moves our spirits. And, um, you know, remember in the Old Testament when Saul was being tormented and he, what he would do to calm his spirit is he would call David in to play music for him. In 1 Samuel 16, 23, it says, and so it was whenever the spirit of God was upon Saul, David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Or um, also when the kings of Israel and Judah, they would call on like Elisha to come and prophesy to them. Um, one of the ways that he would open his heart to hear from the Lord was through music. So in 2 Kings 3.15, it says, um, Elijah said, now bring me a harpist. And while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came on Elisha. See, our spirits were created to receive respond to music. And, and that's because music is a really important tool, but I just don't want us to get confused that, that worship is music. Uh, music is a vehicle that we can use to express our worship and what a fulfilling expression it is. It, it, it's awesome. It, it, it's amazing. I, I love it, but music in and of itself is not worship. Okay. So that's number one. So then if, if music isn't worship, what is worship? Well, truly defining worship is very difficult um, because number two, worship is both an attitude and an act. Okay, so it's an attitude and it's an act. Um, in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, it says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And then um, in another version, the message version, I, I just like the way it's worded, so I'm going to read it as well. It says, These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they are worshiping me, but they don't mean it. So what scripture is saying here is that you can do as many deeds as you want, and you can go to as many church services as you want and not actually be worshiping, right? Like if it's all external and nothing is happening in your heart towards God, then it's not Worship. You can have all the acts of worship down, right? So like you know how to raise your hands or you know how to close your eyes or you know how to put on the performance of worship. But if your attitude is not right, then it is not worship because worship is both an attitude and an act. Worship is an attitude that motivates every action of our lives. And so when worship becomes the attitude of my heart, then I begin to see it motivate every action of my life. So the attitude is, is worship, like wanting and, and wanting to follow the Lord and wanting to serve him and wanting to worship. That's, that's the attitude. When that attitude is right, then it's going to motivate you then to walk out the actions of worship. And so um, number two, so worship is both an attitude and an act. And number three, worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle. You see, it's not just an event. It's not just a place, but it's actually a way of life. It's the result of our decisions to exalt God above everything else. So when we decide to exalt God above everything else and everyone else, that is worship. That is the result of that is worship. It, it is the way that we live when we realize and we acknowledge that God is truly great and worthy of our praise. Um, I was reading uh, a lot of a lot of this stuff that I uh, am talking about today came from a book um, called How to Worship the King. Um, it's an excellent book. I would definitely recommend you to read it. But um, one of the things it talks about is that the English word worship, um, it actually comes from an old English word that was two words, worth ship. So like worth ship. So what it actually means is worship means to give something worth or to attribute value to it. And so, so worship is showing or displaying 
the worth of God. It's attributing worth to God. And, and of course, we know that God's worth is infinite, right? Like there is nothing greater or of more worth than God. And so, so I believe that one of the ways we could devi- define worship is we could say worship is valuing or treasuring God above all things, valuing and treasuring God above all things. And so, so how do we live this? If worship is a lifestyle of, of valuing and treasuring God, um, how do we live this lifestyle? Um, how can we, how can we do that? Well, one of the first steps to living a true lifestyle of worship is submission, submission. Like whenever you value and you treasure God above all things, that means you are willing to submit yourself to him and to give him that worth that he deserves. And so the definition of submit is to accept or yield to superior force or to the will or authority of another person. So, so um, another definition would be to stop trying to fight or to resist something. That's what submission is all about. So if we really desire to worship God with our lives, making it a lifestyle, then we've got to stop trying to fight and resist his lordship, right? Um, we've got to accept and yield to his authority, and we've got to submit. Well, I will be the first to tell you that ain't easy. (laughs) Um, And it's definitely not easy for me. I have um, a strong personality. Um, I have been known to say the words, you're not the boss of me. Um, On more than one occasion, growing up as a kid, um, I had an older brother and, you know, many times I would tell him, Chad, you are not the boss of me. Like, stop trying to tell me what to do. You ain't my mama. You ain't my daddy. You are not the boss of me. Um, And uh, sorry, Sean, I'm sure maybe there might have been a couple times in our marriage where I might have said that to you as well. Like, hey, dude, I love you, but you ain't the boss of me, right? Um, And so, so it... For a lot of us, that, that's hard, right? To submit and allow someone lordship over your life. And, and although I don't think I have ever dared to like actually say the words to God, like you're not the boss of me, like that would be really bold. And I, I don't think I'm quite that bold to say that with my words. But how many times has um, my life made that statement? you're not the boss of me, right? Like how many times have my actions made that statement to God, you're not the boss of me? And so so what does it look like to live a life that is submitted to God? Um, In Romans 12, one, it says, um, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Isn't that so powerful? Another version um, says it like this. It says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So what is he asking for us to do? What, what is he asking for us to do in worship? He wants us to take our lives, the everyday, the mundane, the, the, the going to school, the going to work, the getting up, the taking care of the kids, the making uh, breakfast, making dinner, cleaning the house, you know, making the money, whatever it is, take all, every part of our lives and he just wants us to lay it at his feet. And he wants us to take ourselves off the throne of our lives and put him where he belongs. To stop saying, maybe not with our words, but with our attitudes and with our lives, you're not the boss of me. And actually going, you know what? Yeah, God, I want you to be the boss of me. I want you to sit on the throne. I heard a quote um, that said, uh, whoever sits on the throne of your heart orders your life. 
Whoever sits on the throne of your heart orders your life. And so what, what that's saying is that as humans, we were created to worship. There was like a nature put inside of us that was designed and created to worship. We are going to worship no matter what. The question is not, will you worship? But the question is, what will you worship? Look around this world, even non-believers, they're all worshiping. They're worshiping the wrong things. Even in the church, some of us, we're worshiping, but we may be worshiping the wrong things. Um, we're all going to worship, but what will we worship? What are we putting on the throne of our hearts? Think about it for just a minute. Like, is it your family that's on the throne? Is that your focus? Is that your attention? Is, is it your work or your business? Is that what's on the throne? Is it um, money or material things? Is it relationships? Is it entertainment? You know, whatever it is that, that you put on the throne, like as this, that you put in a, a place of honor that you are, are putting at the head, the rest of your life is going to come in line with whatever or whoever you worship. And I know it might be weird to be like, well, Krista, like I don't worship those other things. Like I don't worship my job. I don't worship my family. I don't worship my career or whatever it is. But, but what I would say to you is, okay, where is all of your time spent? Where is all of your attention directed? Like when you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing that you think about? Because those are the things that we're worshiping. Those are the things that we're putting on the throne of our heart. And whatever is on the throne of our heart, it orders our life. Everything else is going to follow suit in that. So so worship is choosing to put God on the throne of our heart and submitting to him and letting the rest of our life come in line with him. In Romans 1.25, it says, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. So if we want to truly live this lifestyle of worship, we must submit our lives to him, every single part of our life, every plan, um, and we've got to stop worshiping the things that God created, and we've got to start worshiping the creator. We've got to put him back on the throne of our lives. You see, Worship is a lifestyle. It can't be compartmentalized. Um, it's not just singing songs on Sunday morning. It's not just a part of our life, but it actually is our life. Worship is a lifestyle. So, um, so worship is not music. Um, worship is a lifestyle. The next is worship is a sacrifice. Worship is a sacrifice. So Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2 says... I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body, bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Worship um, is a sacrifice. And in, what do I know about a sacrifice? I know that a sacrifice costs us something. A sacrifice is going to cost you something. So maybe it's sacrificing your own plans um, and, and choosing God's plan, or maybe it's sacrificing um, your comfort zone and following God into a new uncharted territory, or, or maybe it's sacrificing time in order to spend time in his presence. But it's going to cost you something. It is a sacrifice. You know, imagine uh, a friend came to you this is just all imaginary, of course, um, and said, you know what? I just, I don't understand my wife. Like, I don't get her. We celebrated our anniversary. I took her to eat. Um, then we saw a movie, and she's mad at me because it seems like nothing I can do will ever please her, and it's just never enough, never enough. But then when you do a little digging, a little deeper, you find out the, what really happened was that your friend took his wife to the hot dog stand for dinner 
and told her to pick out a movie on Netflix because he didn't want to spend too much money on the date because he was saving to get a new gadget for his mountain bike. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> I said this was all imaginary. It's totally imaginary. <laughs> it really is imaginary. <laughs> Promise. But I had to throw them under the bus a little bit. Keep you guys awake. Make sure you're paying attention. So uh, that's true. <laughs> so, but, but, but all of a sudden, you know, your, your friend tells you the story, but then when you get the really, the details, all of a sudden you begin to understand why his wife is upset, right? Because and maybe she's even questioning his love for her because the level of what was spent and the time that was given compared to the, the time and effort and the money that he spent on things that he wanted really, it really like, like kind of revealed, right, where his heart was, right? His heart was maybe not so much in the, the anniversary and the marriage, but his heart was really on that mountain bike gadget that he really wanted. And so, you know, as we are willing to offer our bodies or our lives as a sacrifice of worship to God, it reveals to him where our hearts really are. Okay, does that make sense? It's kind of a silly illustration, but it's like, hey, like God can tell where your heart is by the sacrifices of worship that you're willing to make to him. It shows him that we are valuing and treasuring him above all else. Or it shows him that we are not valuing and treasuring him above all else. But, but that, that's, what, that's what worship is. It's kind of like a litmus test to show where is your heart. So what is worship? It's more than music or a song. Um, it's an attitude and an act. It's a lifestyle and it's a sacrifice. And, and I could honestly go on all night about what worship is. And, and the list I gave you is not a complete definition, okay? Like there's much more to it, but I just kind of wanted to give us a basis to, to start from um, because now I kind of want to go uh, to the next question. So not what is worship, but how do we express our worship? How do we express our worship? So, so one of the ways we express our worship is through obedience. It's through obedience. Um, you know, if worship is expressing our love to God, then one of the ways we can express that love is to obey him. That's what scripture is, I mean, scripture is like super clear on that. First John 5, 3 says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. Not jumping up and down and saying hallelujah and raising your hands. That's not, that's not what scripture says love for God is. Love for God is to keep his commands. Every time we are obedient to the word of God, every time we obey when God asks us to do something, that is an expression of of worship. Uh, John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. If you have the commands and you obey them, you're showing God, you're expressing to him, you love him. John 14, 23 says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings. See, scripture states multiple times that if we love God, we will obey him. So one of the greatest ways that we can show love to God, one of the greatest expressions of worship is by obedience. Now, I know for me, I'm the kind of person who wants like a little less talk and a lot more action, right? Like, like I'm like, you know, don't just tell me, blah, 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 like show me show me. And I think in some ways, God is like that as well. He, he's like, you know, don't just tell me you love me. Don't just sing these songs and raise your hands at all the right places. But he wants to see us walk out of worship service and go into the world and obey his commands. That is worship. So another way we can express our worship to God is by using our gifts and talents. We show and express worship by using our gifts and talents. In John 15, 8, it says, When you produce much fruit, you are my disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. When we use the gifts that God has given us, it is an expression of worship. Um, uh, I read a quote from Rick Warren that said, um, Worship is whatever you do that makes God smile. 
And so what makes God smile? You know, something, some people think uh, God only smiles when we're praying. Um, he only smiles when we're singing or when we're going to church. But I believe that God smiles when you use the gifts that he's given you. Um, think about it. Any parents in here or, or Grammys, gram, grandpas, aunties, uncles, um, you know, you can all attest to that feeling when you've worked really hard to pick out the perfect gift for your child or your grandchild or your niece or your nephew, right? And, and man, you, you just, you've thought about it and you've just picked the perfect thing. And then, man, when they love it, like there's just nothing like it when they like actually open that gift and, and instead of just like throwing it aside and starting to play with the box, when they like actually like really just, just they sit and they play with it and they tell you how much they love it. And then, and then even later on, you know, maybe weeks later you see them, they're still like bringing that, that stuffed animal around or they're still playing with that same toy. There's really no better feeling than knowing that they loved what you gave them and that, that they're using it and that it's, it's bringing them joy. And I think that God loves it when we do what he created and what he gifted us to do. He has given us gifts as well. He's wired us to do certain things. And, and I think that it brings him joy to see us operate in those gifts and, and use those gifts. And in Colossians 3.23, it says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord, not man. And so that's, that's part of the way that we worship, you know, is it's not just, not, it's, it's not even just, this is part of it. So, so I don't want to like completely compartmentalize it, but it's not just like using your gifts in the church, Right? Like, um, I, th I think it's awesome. I think God loves it when he's given you a voice to sing and you sing on the worship team. That's amazing. Um, he's given you the gift of hospitality and you work in the coffee bar. That's incredible. I think that makes God smile. I think that is a, a, an act of worship that we do. But, but it's also just in your everyday life. When you use those gifts every single day to the to the people who are around you, um, and you work at things as if to God and not to man. That is a part of worship. Um, have you guys, any of you seen that old movie, The Chariots of Fire? Like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay. If you're too young for that, I'm sorry. Um, well, it, it's about this Olympic runner, um, and he's a gold medal winner, Eric Liddell, okay? And there's this moment in the movie where Eric says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. When I run, I feel God's pleasure because God has gifted him to run. And when he runs, he feels, it's like that scripture says, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord and not man. He was gifted to run and he used that gift um, to bring glory to God. And when we use our gifts correctly and we, when we bear fruit, um, God gets the glory and that is an expression of worship. That is an expression of worship, using our gifts and our talents. And so um, then the third way that I want to talk about how we express our worship. And it's probably the most common one and probably what you all expected me to teach on tonight for the whole time is um, number three, we express our worship through music and song. Okay, we express our worship through music and song. Singing to the Lord is not just a suggestion in scripture. It is actually a command. Um, there's a lot of scriptures, but I'll just read a few, a few of them where, where this command is issued. Um, First Chronicles 16.23 says, Sing to the Lord, all the earth, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Um, Psalm 717 says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praises to the name of the Lord most high. Psalm 30 verse four says, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his and give thanks to, um, give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Psalm 68, 32 says, sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises to the Lord. So um, I understand that some people don't like to sing or they're uncomfortable to sing to God because they feel like they don't have good voices, okay? But we don't sing to God because we are good singers. We sing because he is a good God. 
Okay, so it really has nothing to do with how good of a singer you are. It really has everything to do with how good our God is. So, so don't worry about whether or not your singing is good enough for the worship team or, or good enough for the radio. That's not your audience. God is your audience, and he loves to hear you sing. He loves to hear you sing. Um, but we don't just express um, worship through music by singing, but we also express it through instruments. Um, in 2 Samuel 6, 5, it says, Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on string instruments, on tambourines, on a sistrum, and on cymbals. Um, 1 Chronicles 15, 16 says, Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers, accompanied by instruments of music, Music, string instruments, harps, and cymbals by raising the voice with resounding joy. Now, uh, here's the cool thing. You don't even have to go learn uh, to play an instrument to express your worship to the Lord through song and music. Like God actually, I talked about it before, he created us with built-in instruments of praise. We have an instrument strategically placed at the each, each one of our arms right here. And that is an instrument. Psalm 47, one says, oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Why do we clap? Why do we worship? Scripture tells us to God designed us with instruments to, on our bodies to bring him glory. We have been designed with percussion instruments in our bodies. We, we may not play an instrument up on the stage, but every individual has been equipped by God with instruments to express our worship. We have melodic instruments of our voices that we can use by singing and by shouting God's praises. And then we have rhythm instruments with our hands and with our feet. Isn't that so cool? Like we have like a full on band right here in our bodies, y'all. Like. Some of you that aren't musical or you're like, I've never, I've always wanted to be in a band. Well, you are a band. That's what I'm telling you right now. You are a band. And you can, if you think that's cool, like if you always thought like being in a band was cool, now you can be like, I'm cool because I, I'm not only in a band, I am a band. Krista said so. Um, so use the instruments God has given you to express your worship and to praise him. Another way we express our worship is by raising our hands. Okay. Um, a lot of people, especially if they didn't grow up in churches that were, are more Pentecostal like ours or charismatic, um, they're like, whoa, like, why is everybody raising their hands? What, this is a little strange, guys. Um, well, Psalms 134, 2 says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Uh, Lamentations 3:41 says, let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Um, first Timothy two, eight says in every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Um, another translation says, I desire therefore that man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so if you've ever questioned like, why are they doing that? Um, well, it's scriptural. Um, but also just to kind of give you like a, a practical thing. I remember when Ellie was little and she would want me to pick her up, right? What would she do? She would turn, she would face me and she would lift up her little hands towards me. And I like to think that when I lift my hands to God, I am signaling to him man, I just, I need you to pick me up. Like I, I need you, I want to be close to you. I want you to hold me. Um, so it could be something like that. It, it's also um, an act of surrender. You know, think about like if like in the, in the movies when the, the burglars come, you know, and they say, stick them up, you know, your hands, oh, hands up, right? You're, you're, you're like surrendering. You're like, okay, whatever you want, right? You can take whatever you want. That's also an expression to God of surrendering to his will. We're lifting our hands to symbolize um, our lives as a sacrifice of worship to God. Like you can have whatever you want, God. It's all yours. Like here, take it, take me. Um, so not only do we sing and shout and clap and lift our hands as an expression of worship to God through music and song, but um, another way is by bowing, 
bowing is a, a biblical expression of worship. In, in Psalm 95, 6, it says, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Um, Ephesians 3, 4 says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Nehemiah 8, 6, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Um, you know, the Hebrew word that's in... Please forgive me, I do not speak Hebrew or Greek, so the pronunciation, I'm sure, is going to get butchered. But the Hebrew word that's most uh, often translated as worship is shaka, I think, something like that. And what it, it simply means bow. So a lot of times when you see the word worship um, in scripture, it, it actually means to bow. Um, in the New Testament, one of the Greek words that's used for worship is proskuneo. Proscunio, I don't know, something like that. Um, and that actually means to prostrate yourself before something. You know, Sean talked about that on Sunday, um, prostrating yourself, humbling yourself, bowing, laying low. Um, so any way you look at it, bowing is a, a, a very important expression of worship. It's an outward expression of what your heart on the inside is saying, like, I humble myself. I put myself down low so that you could be exalted up high. And, um, you know, it, it's not like for show or for whatever. It's just, it's just a way to express, um, you know, think about it. Uh, citizens and subjects and children alike, they all bow before the king. Like, even if you go to England now, um, you know, King Charles or whoever, you know, like if you were to see him, everyone would bow before the king. And so it communicates honor and respect for the authority and the majesty of the king. Well, well, as we bow before him in worship, it, it does the same thing. It, it communicates a, a humility an honor and a respect um, for the majesty and the lordship of God. And so there's, there's a lot of other ways that you can express your worship to God. We, I'm not this is not an all-inclusive list, but I just wanted to kind of touch on some of the ways that we do here at the Grace Place so you can kind of understand what is the meaning behind it? Why do we do those things? And so um, we talked first about what is worship. Um, then we talked about how we express worship. And then finally today, we're going to get to our question, the reasons why, um, and it'll be quick, but why do we worship? Uh, number one, because God commands it. Pretty much I could just put the mic down and we could all go home from there, right? Like, because God commands it. In, in Luke 4, 8, Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. In Romans 14, 11, um, it says, for the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. And so these are just a few scriptures where God uh, commands us to worship. Uh, and like I said, uh, that's pretty much case closed. He commands it, let's, let's all do it and let's go home. Um, but I'm gonna give you a couple more reasons why we worship not only because God commands it, um, but we also worship because we realize who we are. Because we realize who we are. Um, I want to read just a story of a woman in the Bible who I think is just a beautiful picture, and I, I feel like she really understood why we worship. And it's um, found in Luke chapter 7, uh, verses 36 through 49. It's a little lengthy to read, but I just want you to just listen to this woman and, and, and see this picture of worship that is portrayed here um, in these verses. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. 
Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he replied. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. See, this woman is such a great picture of why we worship. This woman knew who she was. She understood that she was a sinner and she was very aware of the fact that she needed a savior. And out of that understanding, her worship flowed so freely. You know, you, you think about um, Simon in this story, like he, he just didn't get it. He didn't realize who he was. And so he didn't pour out worship because he was really thought he was just pretty good himself, all on, him, on, on his own. And when we walk around feeling that way, it, our worship doesn't flow freely. So one of the reasons why we worship is because we recognize um, who we are. And, and, and because that she understood that, this woman understood who she were, who she was and how much she had been saved from and what Christ had done from her, she didn't care what others thought of her. She didn't care how much it cost her. She was just so thankful to Jesus for saving her and for forgiving her. You know, why did she worship, worship so extravagantly? Because she realized who she was without Jesus. And she was grateful that she didn't have to remain that way. And, you know, I think sometimes uh, we can get really caught up in proclaiming like who we are in Christ. And, and I'm not against that. I, I think we should be, be very, you know, um, trying to think of the word. Not proud is not the word I'm trying, but we, we should be excited and proclaim who we are in Christ. You know, like we are a child of God and we're the head and we're not the tail and we're above and not below. And, and although that is true, um, I just, I just hope we understand that, that all those things, anything that is good, anything that we have does not come from who we are, but it comes from who we are in Christ. And when we realize like who we are outside of Christ, like, and, but, but the fact that we have the opportunity to be something else in Christ, then our worship, sh that's why we worship. Like that's why we worship. It should flow extravagantly when we realize how, like how wretched we are without him. And yet he still chose us. He still forgave us. He still pulled us um, out of our sin and out of our shame. Um, John 15, five says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in him will produce much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing at all. If we remember that, like apart from him, there is nothing. Romans 3, 10 and 12 says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Like none of us are good on our own. It's only in Christ. And, and I love how Jesus said, when those who have been forgiven much, they love much. Like when you recognize how much you've been forgiven of, you're going to worship differently. It's going to flow. It's going to be more extravagant. When we realize we have all been forgiven so much, we all have a reason to pour out extravagant love on the master. We all have a reason to worship. So, you know, what was it that kept um, Simon from realizing and understanding his need to worship Jesus? I think it was his pride. 
that allowed him to forget his need for a savior. He thought he could save himself by doing good and by checking off all of his religious duties. But, but church, let me encourage you today, let us not forget who we are without Christ. Let us not forget, let us not be like Simon who instead of throwing himself at the feet of Jesus to thank him for his salvation, he instead stood in judgment of another who worshiped extravagantly. Don't forget that if there is anything good, anything pleasing, anything holy in you, it comes directly from Jesus. And when we realize who we are apart from Jesus, we cannot help but worship. That's, that's why we worship. Um, so, okay, let me, I'm going to skip a couple of things here and get down to the end. Okay, so I want to just answer one quick question of not only why we worship, but why is it important for us to worship corporately, like together, um, to come together in unity as a church? Um, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, what happens when we come together as a, as a church family, as a body to express our worship? Well, scripture says that we stir each other up. We stir each other up. You know, when you come in on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, my desire as I'm leading worship, um, it's to stir you up. You know, like you, you, I want you to leave differently. I want you to leave encouraged and, and inspired and challenged. And, you know, um, maybe the thing is, is that it, it's not just my job as a worship leader, or it's not just the worship team, but actually all of us, when we come together, the person next to you, you should be, your desire should be like, let's stir each other up. Let's stir each other up in our worship. Now, you may come down, you may be depressed or discouraged, or, uh, but you know what? If you sit next to the right person, I guarantee you, if you sit next to Tara on a Sunday morning, you can come in down and struggling and discouraged. But I guarantee you, if you sit by Tara, you ain't going to leave that way. Like she's going to stir you up. A person who is loving and expressing their pure worship to God um, is it's just going to kind of sneak on over to you. Um, and you just might get a little stirred up yourself. You know, um, sometimes we're the ones who get stirred up and sometimes we're the stirrers. And that's the thing about coming together in a group is that on the day where maybe you need to be stirred up, there's someone there. But there's also days where, you know what, you're doing good and you're stirred up and you can be the stirrer. You know, it's contagious. And, and the thing is, is that it's not only scriptural that we stir each other up, like when we come together, but it's actually scientific, okay? Um, scientists discovered that humans were actually soft-wired with something called mirror neurons, okay? And that, what this means, I'm such not a science geek, so, that, but I think this is so cool. What it means is that our brains can actually experience the same emotion as someone that we are watching if we're tuned into them. So basically, scientifically, emotion is contagious, okay? We're all wired in such a way where I can, you can experience each other's reality by watching them experience it. And so a, an example would be, have you ever been watching a movie and like someone is underwater in the movie, but you start holding your breath? <laughs> And like, you're like, why am I holding my breath? I am not underwater. But you're watching them and like, you're, it's, it's subconscious. You don't even real, it's mirror neurons. Okay, scientific word. It, it, you're like watching them experience it. So like, it, like, it's contagious. You like start holding your breath also. I'm the worst. I, I, when someone on a show or a movie is being embarrassing or doing something that is embarrassing or uncomfortable, like I start to get embarrassed like my face turns red, like I get uncomfortable myself. Like sometimes I just want to leave the movie because I just feel so bad. I, I remember watching that movie, um, Never Been Kissed. And like the girl, Drew Barrymore in the movie, like she's just, she's so 
like cringe, I guess that's the word that all the, the kids are using nowadays. Like she's so uncomfortable, like she, it's just, she's so embarrassing. And I almost could not sit through the movie because I was so embarrassed for her. It was those mirror neurons that I was experiencing like secondhand embarrassment by watching her. Um, and, or think about even as small as like when someone smiles at you, you typically smile back without thinking about it, right? Like it's just, that's mirror neurons. And so when you come into church and you feel defeated, but the worship team starts singing and they have freedom and they have joy and victory on their face or the person next to you, you got Tara next to you and, and she begins to sing and she begins to, to express herself in worship and you begin to feel that and you begin to experience that reality yourself. And so you are being stirred up. You are being, um, you're, you start to experience what they are experiencing and, and we're stirring each other up. And, and like I said, some days we're the stirs and some days we need to be stirred, but the fact is that we need each other. And that's why it's so important um, to come together for corporate worship. I mean, yes, it, your, day, your daily relationship with God um, is so, so important, but you need these, these corporate times because there's, that's just how God created us. He created us to need each other. Um, Psalm 34, three says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together, together. There's just something about coming together and worshiping together. And so we talked about what is worship, how we express worship and why we worship and we're done.